in our text this morning in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, and we're going to read verse number 16 again. And uh, I think this is maybe our, our fourth week, is that right? Third or fourth week uh, so far in uh, looking at the contents here of John 3, 16, and just really unpacking the various truths that are brought to our attention. Uh, we've defined the term world um, as in God loving the world, who exactly is the world. We have looked particularly at the love of God in, in two different ways of really viewing that love, that is, the benevolent love that God has for every individual in the whole entire world, uh, a fact that's brought out by the Apostle Paul in Acts 17, in Him we live and move and have our being, that the fact that God causes it to rain on the just as well as the unjust, uh, we would liken it to the common grace of God, that God is generally good, benevolent, and therefore loving of all of humanity. But then there's that special love of God that He has for those who are redeemed, that, uh, that He loves us es telos. Remember John 13, verse number 1? He loved His own. Having loved His own, He loved them unto the end with the fullest capability of His love. This morning we want to Notice a, a separate phrase, expression, here in, inside of verse number 16. And focus our attention on the thought of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. What one preacher said like this, No man ever was born like this man. No man ever lived like this man. No man ever died like this man. No man ever got up like this man. And no, no one's going to come back <laughs> like this man. Truly, Jesus Christ is unique. In fact, the word itself, unique, doesn't even seem sufficient to describe Him. He is in a class, literally, all by Himself. And so we'll, we'll notice that together this morning. John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here in verse 16, Jesus makes a very emphatic statement, and I would call to our memory again this morning that, that Jesus has been in a continuous dialogue with one of the most religious individuals in the entire world at this point in time. He, he's in conversation with Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, um, a master in Israel. He, he, he wasn't just a rabbi. He was a teacher of rabbis. He, he was one of the most learned men as far as Judaism was concerned. He had a passion and a heart for God, which, which really unfolds itself throughout John chapter 3, that, that he wouldn't just turn a, a, a blind eye and a deaf ear to Christ, but, but the miracles, the workings of Christ are, are throwing up flags and signals in Nicodemus' mind. So, so Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. I, I can never think about this story without thinking about Brother Tim Gammons, pastor of Woodland Baptist Church in Winston-Salem, preaching on Nick at night. <laughs> uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Um, and, and you can make out of that whatever you want to, but praise God, he came. And there was a thought that was on his heart. He, he never revealed it. At, at least he didn't think he did, but he was talking to the one who knows all about us. And so Jesus, perceiving the, the really question on his heart, tells Nicodemus that unless he was born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And, and so that dialogue be between the two begins. And, and that is the continuous dialogue here that, that we find the, the setting of verse number 16, the jewel in the middle of the crown, as it were. And so Jesus comes now in this conversation to make this very emphatic statement that God so loves the world. And here's, here's the crucial point of that, that that we want to see this morning. That He gave His only begotten Son. If I could paraphrase uh, the entirety of verse number 16, um, I, I'm going to do that for us, and then I'm going to circle back around to just one particular part of this. Here would be just my own personal paraphrase Verse number 6. Now, I won't be putting it in book form if you're worried about that. Uh, the Father loved the world so much that He gave Jesus that whoever trusts in Him will not go to hell, 
but will be saved. There's, there's the gist. That, that wouldn't hold up probably against textual criticism. But there's the gist of the message of verse number 16. Now I want to circle back around to just one part that we'll focus our attention on together uh, through our, uh, our time together this morning. Uh, the, the gist of verse number 16 is this. The Father gave Jesus. That, that's really why we're here this morning, isn't it? That, that's really why the choir sang the songs that they did. That, that's why some of you, upon entering this morning, put money in a little black box. Um, hopefully, that's the reason why you did that. Hopefully, you didn't do that to buy you a blessing. Huh? Because it really doesn't work that way. Uh, that, that, that's why we read our Bible. That's why we pray. That's, that's why we stand and we testify of the hope of everlasting life, isn't it? Because the Father gave Jesus. You, you know, everything else is insignificant and really inconsequential. You and I are lost, hell-deserving sinners. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves that is attainable to the standard of the righteousness of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. We, we've done what's right in our own eyes. The only problem with that is we're not the measuring stick. We're not the plumb line. We're not the standard. And, and so we have fallen way short. Romans 3.23 said that, the, that, that for all have sinned and come short. But we fall short of the standard, short of the glory of God. Uh, we're sinners by nature, sinners by choice. Um, we, are, we are just rotten. Totally. But God loved us. And the significance of that love is that He gave Jesus. And what's interesting to me in verse number 16 is this is Jesus speaking. Uh, and, and so He's saying, you know, the Father, uh, my Father, our Father, the one I came from, He loves you <laughs> so much that He gave me. <laughs> Uh, that, that's essentially exactly what Christ is saying here. The, the interest, though, uh, that I have is that the way Jesus refers to Himself, He, he didn't, and I'm not, you English majors could, could set me straight on first person, second person, third person. I'll not enter into that territory this morning. But, but He could have said, uh, for God so loved the world that He gave Jesus, and, and just inserted his name there. Uh, he, he didn't do that, and, and that might have seemed weird. Like, it would seem weird if, if I come up to you and say, and said, hey, uh, hey, your parents loved you so much they gave you Stanley. That would be weird. <laughs> you probably shouldn't attend our church anymore if, if, if I was to talk like that. Um, so see, Jesus didn't say it like that. But it is interesting to me that he, that he didn't say, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. And he didn't say, for God so loved the world, that He gave me. That would have been appropriate to say, wouldn't it? That hey, God loved you so much that, that He gave you me. That, that would have been emphatically correct and, and right. And yet, Jesus makes sure, and John records, because the Holy Spirit approves of it, that, that Jesus says that God so loved the world that He gave. Here's the, here's the emphatic statement. His only begotten Son. What exactly does that expression mean? And really, how, how is that expression intended to be interpreted beings that, that God actually refers to Adam as His Son as well? The first man ever created in Luke chapter 3 and verse 38 is, is called the Son of God. And so, if Adam is denoted as the Son of God, how is Jesus termed to be the only begotten Son of God? And I would go even beyond that. Well, why is it so important that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God? Why couldn't He have said, the Father loved you so much that He gave you me? Or, or that He gave you the Son? Why, 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 why the expression, the only begotten Son? So let's start there, just looking at that uh, expression. There are certain cult groups, uh, cult religions that are vaguely based on the Scriptures that actually use this terminology to actually deny the deity of Jesus. 
Uh, one of those cult religions would be the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, they would see in this expression, the only begotten Son, the concept of origin. They, they would say, well, the Bible says that Jesus was begotten, and if Jesus is begotten, even if He is the only begotten, then that denotes origin. And so if Jesus has an origin, He's not eternal. And therefore, if He's not eternal, He's not divine. And so they, they would go as far as to deny the deity of Jesus. Uh, other cult groups, like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as Mormons, uh, would, um, would, would propose falsely again, from, from largely in part from this phraseology here, that, that Jesus wasn't originally God, but that He became a God because He is begotten of the Father, and so they deny the eternal sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would say that Jesus simply became a God in the same way that you and I could become gods and eventually rule over our own entire universe. Several problems with that, of course, in Scripture. Number one, mainly being there's only one God, big G God. And, and that's who we're dealing with here in the text. And so you couldn't become another one because that would mean that there was more than one and, and the whole totality, totality of this thing just simply falls apart. And, and so there are wrong ways of interpreting this. Th this isn't your child's uh, second grade public educational class where everybody's right. <laughs> uh, those are wrong ways of interpreting this uh, phraseology, the only begotten Son of God. One commentator pointed this out, and I love this. He said the misinterpretations here associated with the only begotten Son, is an example of interpreting Jewish literature with a Gentile vocabulary. Uh, uh, we have to keep in mind that the Bible predominantly is a Jewish book, predominantly written by Jewish men to predominantly a Jewish audience. And so the expression only begotten is actually one word in the Greek language. It is the word monogenes. Monogenes. And, and the word does not refer to origin, it actually refers to uniqueness. Jesus is the unique Son of God. So it does not suppose origin, but it stresses Jesus to be unique, meaning He is one of a kind. There is not another one like this one. In case you're struggling with that, this is the same language that's used of Isaac all the way back in the story of Genesis chapter number 22, you're probably familiar with that as a Bible student. Uh, the Bible says that there came a day where the Lord, Jehovah, appears to Abraham. And He tells Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Remember that? It was a horrific story, really, at the outset. As you read it for the first time, you're, you're, you're sitting on the edge of your seat, your skin's crawling. The hairs on your back are standing straight on end because you're wondering what is unfolding. The, the God is telling His choice servant, the one He's established His covenant relationship with, to take His Son, who is the promised Son, and go kill Him in a human sacrifice. And, I mean, there's all kinds of red flags, right, that are being thrown up all across uh, the, the place. And so the specific language of Genesis 22 is take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. Well, here's the problem. Isaac isn't the only son of Abraham. Uh, there was one before him by the name of Ishmael who was older than, than Isaac. Uh, a further problem is that Abraham's actually going to go on to have six more children. So, so a combined total of eight children there's no way that Isaac could be considered to be the only one in a, in a quantitative sense. So, so how is Isaac considered to be the only son of Abraham? Well, well, the reason why he can be considered that is because he's one of a kind. He's one of a kind in the sense that he's the covenant son. He's the promise. He's the son that the blessing is going to come through. Not Ishmael, not any one of the others, 
but, but through this particular son. He's the promised one. And so there's no one, there's not another one that's, that's like him in, in the same way. In, in the same way. What, what, we're, what we're dealing with is a special relationship here, okay? Uh, it, it means only, the, the word only in verse uh, 16, John 3, 16 here, means only in the sense of no others. Uh, it's, it's one of the sense of one in a kind. Uh, just like Isaac was the only one of his kind, the only son, the son of the covenant. Uh, therefore, Isaac shares a special relationship and cut connection with Abraham. So Jesus Christ shares in a special relationship and a special connection with the Father that no one else enjoys. And we'll, we'll deal with that here in just a moment. I, I would point out again, if we were just back back up, that there are others that are denoted throughout the Bible by the term sons of God. We've already pointed out one, Adam, in Luke chapter 3, verse 38, in that genealogical record. Uh, Luke works in a backwards fashion going from Jesus, works all the way back through the line of David, beyond Abraham, back to the very beginning, and of course winds up back to Adam, and he says, who was the son of God? The special relationship and connection that Adam shares with God is that he was the first man that was created. In Job chapter 1, verse number 6, we're, we're told that the angels of God are considered to be the sons of God. And, and they have a special relationship and connection with God in that they are created to be the very attendants to the throne of God. They are ministers sent forth to minister. They're the very servants of God that do His bidding at a moment's notice. In Romans chapter 8 and verse number 14, we're told that believers are denoted to be the sons of God. Um, again, a special relationship, a special connection by, by as far as you and I are the redeemed. We're, we're the ones that God gave His Son for. And so we share in a special relationship with Him. And therefore, we are, we are termed to be the sons of God. So there are different categories of individuals who are, who are given this significant idea of being called the sons of God. What's being stated, however, in John 3, verse 16, is that Jesus is uniquely the Son of God. He's not in a larger group. He's not in a, in a, in a group at all as far as other attendants inside of that group. Jesus is uniquely the Son of God because of the relationship and connection that He holds with the Father. Uh, he is one with the Father. In fact, Jesus would tell Philip, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He would go on to say things like this, I and the Father are one. He carries the authority of the Father, so much so that in the, uh, in the arrest scene of, Garden, of the Garden of Gethsemane, when, when, when Jesus says, I am, uh, the very name of God uh, in, in the Hebrew, Yahweh, the self-existent one, the one that always is, He's not the one that was, and he's not just the one that will be. He's the one that he is. And, and you, can, you can put that anywhere you want to because he doesn't inhabit time. He's the ancient of days. He inhabits eternity. And, and so when Jesus just simply says, I am, they fall back as dead men. Which is the proper response for sinful man to be in the presence of a thrice holy God. And so Jesus is unique. You have your Bibles open there, John 3. If you'll look back with me at the first chapter of the Gospel of John. John's going to labor very extensively to show this time and time again, pointing out the uniqueness of this man by the name of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1 and verse number 1, he's going to show that Jesus is unique because of His pre-existence. Notice it with me, the term word here, an obvious reference to Jesus, which is denoted by verse 14 later on. And so in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Notice verse number two. The same was in the beginning with God. Now again, I just, I just mentioned that according to verse number 14, it's obvious that the term word here is, uh, is a word, logos, that's employed to refer to Jesus Himself because the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. We behold His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And it's obvious as Jesus. So you go back into verse number one and you read, in the beginning was... Well, Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. Watch verse number 2. The same, that is Jesus, was in the beginning with God. And so we see the preexistence 
of Jesus. When you get to the beginning, He's already there. He is the eternally existent one. Which denies, again, the teaching of Mormonism. That, that would say that Jesus uh, merely became at some point. No, no, no. No, He didn't become. He always has been. And so He's unique in that sense. Well, verse number 3 points out another unique feature of Jesus Christ. And that deals with His work. Verse number 3, all things were made by Jesus, by Him. And without Jesus was not anything made that was made. So He's not only, listen, He is not only with God, He is God, He was there with God, so He's the same as God, yet He's distinct from God, which gives us uh, our, our doctrine of the Godhead, the, the beginnings of the inner workings of the Trinitarian relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But now we're denoted in a more specific way that this blessed member of the Holy Trinity is the creative force behind everything. That all things uh, were, that, that were made were made by Him insomuch that without Him there was not anything made that was made. That's pretty strong. That, that puts you in a category all by yourself. Well, uh, a little bit later on, if you'll notice with me, verse number 18, we see that Jesus is unique in the uh, sense of revelation. Verse number 18, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. D declared, revealed expressed, shown, displayed, put on display for us. No man has seen God at any time. But notice the phraseology again. But the only begotten Son. Could have said Jesus. Could have said Him. But, but it's, it's drawing attention to the uniqueness of Jesus. This unique Son. This only begotten Son. The one that's different than Adam. The one that's different than the angels. The one that's different than believers. This, this unique Son uh, of God, uh, which is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared Him. He is the source of revelation. Um, Brother Mason read this morning from Hebrews chapter 1. And in verse number 3, you remember, uh, as he was reading, he, he called attention to this. In verse number 3, the Bible says about Jesus that He is the express image of the Father. The express. He's not, he's not just the image of the Father. You and I are considered to have been created in the image of God. That, that just simply means that you and I bear a semblance to our Creator. There, there's a resemblance. Now, now granted, 6,000 years of human sinful depravity has marred that semblance. But even in fallen man, there is a, a semblance where we are still the image bearers of God. And as redeemed individuals, you and I have that image being restored in us through a process known as sanctification. Meaning, you're becoming more like Jesus every day if you've genuinely placed your faith in Jesus Christ. We're, we're, we're said to have been created in the image of God. Not in the express image. The word express means the precise, the exact. And the only way that you can get an exact image of oneself is to look at oneself. Uh, it, we're, we're not talking about somebody that just looks like you. We're talking about you standing in front of the mirror. When you stand, that's what I hate about mirrors. <laughs> they show you who you really are. <laughs> well, if you want to see who, who God really is, you just look at Jesus. So, so he's unique in the sense that nobody else declares. And that's what John says in verse number eight. Nobody else can declare him, but he can declare him because he is unique. Well, verse number 17, he's unique in his mediation. Just back one verse. In his mediation. Verse number 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. But John's just simply pointing some information out here to us. He says the law was given by Moses. What does that mean? Well, well, it meant if, if you got the law, you got it by the work of Moses. The only way you got the law is that it was mediated by Moses. The, the law was given by God, and it would be placed in the hands of Israel through a mediator named Moses. If you got the law, you got it by Moses. Well, what does he say in, a, in, in the latter part of verse 17? Well, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Well, you got the law, you had to have Moses. But if you got grace and truth, you had to get it by Jesus. 
He's the mediator of it. There's not another one. There's not another. There's, 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 not, a, there's not many ways to obtaining grace. You can pray through whatever saint you want to, but they can't give you grace. There's no dispensing of grace. There's no one else full of grace. He's the only one that has grace. He's the only one that can give you grace. I submit there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He reaches between both worlds and He connects us. He puts us back together by virtue of the fact that He's unique in the sense that He mediates between God and man on the merits of of grace. For you to get the law, you had to have Moses. For you to get grace, you have to have Jesus. Well, we could we could continue going on. I will point out this isn't necessarily denoted in specific form here in John 1, but it is throughout the gospel narrative that, that one of the unique features of Jesus Christ would be his miracles. Uh, uh, Jesus is going to do so many works that the Bible is going to tell us that if everything that Jesus did was to be recorded in a book that the world couldn't contain the volumes of books that should be written uh, of Him. That's just language that means He did a lot more than you're reading about right here in the book. This is just a small compilation of, of the truths that, that, that God determined that He wanted to be preserved for you and I to read and to have our faith and, and, and encouragement to be increased in Him. There are so many miracles that, that Jesus did. I mean, I mean, amazing things. I, I wish we had time to, to deal with a lot of them this morning. We don't, but I mean, it's just ama- I mean, I, you, you think about something as simple as having a fish swim down and pick a coin up off the bottom of the lake and swim back up and, and Peter to be able to take it out of his mouth. I'd love for that to happen to me one day fishing and a fish swim down and pick up a Benjamin Franklin $100 bill. Somebody say amen and swim back up. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd run a lap on that, praise God. I mean, that'd be neat. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, miracles, some of the miracles I don't even appreciate. Like, like healing a mother-in-law. Why in the world would he want to do that? I mean, there's a lot, a lot of things that, that, that he did. Well, there's some miracles that were in a class all by themselves. I mean, these are miracles that can't be manipulated. And these are miracles that nobody else has ever heard tell of. I mean, these are so far-fetched that Benny Hinn wouldn't even try these things. Okay. I mean, these are like in a class. They're referred to as messianic miracles. In other words, it was understood that if somebody could do these things, well, he's unique. He's got a connection that nobody else has got. Well, guess what? Jesus comes on the scene and he does those exact things. Some of the messianic miracles would be things like healing a Jewish leper. You know, there's no place in in history, in your Bible or outside of the Bible, that speaks of a leprous man who was a Jew who was actually healed. And that, that really was a, a... We don't have time to deal with it, but that was a debated thing. I mean, just a hot... Day. I mean, that bothered the Jewish people so bad because God had decided to heal Gentile lepers, but He hadn't decided ever to heal a Jewish leper. In fact, in the, the story here of Matthew chapter 8, verses 2, 3, and 4, as well as... Oh, let's see, Mark chapter 1, and I believe maybe Luke chapter 12, if I'm remembering right. Um, the Synoptic Gospel, all, all three of them record this miracle. It is, it is so profound uh, that, that He heals this man. And, and their question is, has it ever been told that, that a man who is a Jew has been cured of, of leprosy? And, so, and, and you'll notice with these Messianic miracles showing the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, that there's always a different kind of response. I mean, they didn't like it when He did the other stuff, but when He did these things, they are outraged because they cannot explain what's going on. And so Jesus heals the Jewish leper, and immediately this this attention is placed on Him. And and when you read it, there's just this massive amount of a draw where everybody is coming and flocking to Him now, both good and bad, because they're trying to figure this man out. Well, another one of those miracles is that uh, Jesus cast out a devil, a demon from an individual who was both dumb and deaf. The word dumb there means he can't speak. You ladies might think that's smart, a good quality in a man. Uh, but, but, but it just means he can't speak and he can't hear. Well, no one in, in the world of Judaism ever heard tell of such an exorcism because in, in their ideology, and their philosophy 
of, of this sort of ministry, if you will. You had to be able to communicate with the individual. You had to, you had to gain information and, and communicate. So it meant that the person who was possessed had to be able to hear and speak. Well, Jesus didn't need that to be able to do what he was doing. And so ironically, in Matthew chapter 12, where Jesus cast the demon out of this man who was deaf and dumb, they're going to respond, the religious leaders who have already launched an investigation in the life of Jesus, are going to go as far in Matthew chapter 12 as to say, Jesus is casting out devils by the prince of the devils. And, and in that scene, they're going to commit, Brother Curtis mentioned this morning in Sunday school, what is termed to be the unpardonable sin, and, and that is this, that, that the religious leaders speaking on behalf of the Jewish nation now attribute the works of Jesus Christ to a demonic force and motivation. They commit blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and that generation is lost world without end. They are doomed to the judgment of AD 70. There's nothing that can prevent that from happening at this point in time. But they're launching out with everything. I mean, they, when, when they make that accusation, that's the worst thing they could ever say about Jesus. And they do that because they're saying, we have no other explanation. <laughs> to come up with. Well, there's, there's some other ones. We're not going to deal with them. There's the healing of the man who was born blind in John chapter number 9. And that takes up a whole chapter in John's gospel, 41 verses, because again, the religious leaders are just so outraged by what's going on. Remember, they, they go and they try to find the man and they get in touch with his parents and they're, they're investigating the parents and the parents go so far and they say, hey, you can talk to our son about that. We, we're not sure. They go get the son and the son says, I, I, love, I love his theology. He said, whether this man's a sinner or no, I can't tell you, but I was blind. But now, all I know is I was blind. But I can see now, there's something to that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and, and so by the time you get to the end of that, I mean, they're just, they're just in an irate form. Well, the last one, really, is whenever you can have a man die and be dead for four days. When the sun rises on that fourth day, I mean, I mean everything as far as corruption, deterioration, uh, has set in. In Jewish thought, uh, when a person dies, Jews believe some crazy stuff. And um, rabbis, particularly, not just Jewish. That's not an anti-Semitic stuff. I didn't mean it like that. That sounds bad. Uh, but rabbis believe some pretty crazy stuff. And um, one of the things they believed is when a person died is that your spirit hovered outside of your body for three days. If that's true, I'm not coming to your funeral unless you've been dead for over three days. Um, but, but they believe that. And they believed it was there because it desired to re-enter the body, given the opportunity, and for you to come back to life. And so after three days, it was a done deal. You were dead. Uh, you were dead, really, within the first few minutes. But in their minds, Jesus knows that. And so they come and they tell Jesus, you know, Lazarus is sick, and, and he puts off, he puts off. He's been dead. He's been dead so long that out of Mary Martha's own testimony, he said, Lord, he's been dead so long now, he stinks. It's all set in. It's, it's over with, Jesus. And Jesus says, um, hey, uh, I'm the resurrection and the life. To the extent that though he was dead, he can live again. And so Jesus, with that rallying cry, says, Lazarus, Come forth. One, one Bible teacher said, you know why he had to say Lazarus? Because if not, everybody would have got up from the dead. <laughs> I like that. And so, so he stands and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And they move the, uh, they already moved the stone. And, and, and out comes a man <laughs> walking and he's bound in, uh, in, in, in death clothes. And, and he says, loose him and let him go. And would you not believe that it was Lazarus who had been dead? And, and listen, the religious leaders are so surprised and shocked that by the time you get to the end of John chapter 11, verse 57, they have conspired together. They're putting up wanted ads all over town. And the phraseology is this, that they might take him. They've had it up to here. They're ready to kill him. Now, I'm saying all of that just, just to show that Jesus is unique in a lot of different ways. And, and the Bible produces that all over. In John chapter 3, verse number 16, specifically here in our text, 
Jesus is pointing out His own uniqueness in accomplishing the plan of redemption. He's unique, yes, in His pre-existence, in His work of creation, in His revealing of God, in His mediating of grace, in the miracles that He performs, and so many other categories that we could point out. But in verse 16, Jesus says, I'm, I'm unique in the sense that I'm the one that God can accomplish and will accomplish the plan of redemption through. His emphasis is that the Father sent me, Jesus, because there's no one else to, that He could have sent. I'm, I'm the only one qualified for the task. There is no other. Uh, listen, you, you, there, there's, there's not another one that can come and do what I've come to accomplish. Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, the only way you can be born again is if I go to the cross and I die and I'm buried and I rise again. Nicodemus, that's the only hope that you have. There's not a plan B. There's not what if this plan fails. There's not a what if this happens or that happens. No, no. this is the plan that the Father had predetermined before the foundations of the world and it will be absolutely accomplished. He's the only one qualified for the task. Let me, let me point out just a, a handful of things and, and then we're going we're to close this morning as far as the uniqueness of Jesus as far as redemption is concerned. Number one, if you want to jot down just real quick like uh, he had to be, in his uniqueness, he had to be what we are. Or if you want the simpler version of that, now that you've started writing, you could just write the word identification. He had to be identified with us. This immediately points us to the doctrine of incarnation, what we'll be celebrating here in about two months. The fact that God becomes a man. He has to become who we are. He has to become related to us. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter number 2. And, and here's one of the places in Scripture where the doctrine of identification, the doctrine of incarnation is, is really just unpacked for us in beautiful form. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, for as, much then, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He, that is Jesus, also Himself likewise took part of the same. What does that mean? Well, it means that He became a man, a human. And He did that, that through death... He might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. He became a man. He was born so that he might die. That, that's the reason why Jesus came. He didn't come to heal people physically. He came to heal people spiritually. And to be able to do that, he had to be able to die. But to be able to die, he had to become a man. He had to assume humanity. Verse 15, and deliver them, which would be one of the benefits of this, death. And deliver them who through fear of death are all their lifetime subject to bondage. Verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. Jesus didn't condescend and become an angel. Lesser than divinity, but not to the low level of humanity. No, no, he, he couldn't just become an angel because that's not coming far enough. He had to become what we were. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Meaning he became a man and more particularly, a Jewish man. Verse 17, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him. That means it pleased him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might become a man, right? That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. What does that mean? Well, it means that Jesus in his uniqueness is God... Becoming us. It is God becoming identified with us. It is God becoming man. When you look at Jesus Christ, you're not looking at just a representation of God. You're looking at God. When you think about Jesus Christ, you're not thinking about a person who, who evolved into becoming a God. No, no, you're looking at, at the one, thinking about the one who has always been God, who is still God, and will always be God. He is co-equal, co-existent, eternally existent, with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Now this presents a, a sort of a theological problem because we talk about God not changing. Malachi 3.6, I'm the Lord and I change not. And yet there is a, a change that we see taking place in the birth narrative of Jesus Christ. Because God who is spirit now becomes man for the first time in, uh, in, in forever. Uh, God becomes a man. And yet there's no essential change that takes place because he still retains his divinity. Uh, we talk, again, we don't have time to deal with all this, but we talk about the, the dual nature of, of Jesus, that he was 
and this is how we say it, we say he was 100% God and 100% man. I don't like defining it like that because then you have 200% of something, and that sounds abnormal. I understand what we mean by that, but, but I, I do suppose this morning that he was fully God and fully man. He never divested himself of his deity. He didn't take a, de- a, a divinity off and become a man and then put it back on after he was finished. No, no, he, he retained who he was and yet simultaneously became what we are. Number two, here's the second thing. If you to jot down very quickly in his uniqueness is he had to be distinct from us. I know that's real, real big. He had to be distinct from us. Or you write down the word separation. So you have, number one, you have him becoming what we are. But simultaneously, he has to remain something different from what we are. Uh, This presents the doctrine of the holiness of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus didn't become us in the sense of sinfulness. He he didn't become a, a sinner. He simply took the place of the sinner. He he was found in fashion as a man, and yet he retained the integrity of God. He had to be related to us. But at the same time, he could not be exactly what we are because he had to remain, if he was going to pay the price of our sin, he had to remain a perfect payment. That means he has to be morally, absolutely perfect with no blemish or no fault in him. Here's how the writer of Hebrews puts it. I love this. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, if you want to jot it down. The writer of Hebrews says, For such an high priest, speaking of Jesus, became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Doesn't he capture both ends of the spectrum there? He, Jesus, became us, while at the same time, he was holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners. He, he, he assumed who we are without becoming what we are, if you will. It's not just the, the fact that he didn't sin. It's the fact that he couldn't have the propensity to sin. Because if he had the propensity to sin, that means he's temptable, which means that he's not divinity. Divinity can't be temptable because that gives the idea that there's some sense of a flaw inside of divinity. No, 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 deity can't be temptable. In fact, Jesus says of himself in John 14, verse 30, that the, the evil one, the wicked one, comes, but has nothing in me. <laughs> that is, he has no relationship. There's nothing in me that attracts me to him. I'm flawless. And he had to be that. If he was going to pay sin's price for us, he would have to be related to us as far as humanity is concerned but he would have to remain holy, meaning distinct from us. Here's the third thing, and we'll finish this morning. He had to suffer what we deserve. The the uniqueness of this man, John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God becomes a man to be related to us, however, to remain distinct from us for the sole purpose of of suffering in our place. Which, which, which really is that term, gave. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I, the, the question here is, preacher, what do we deserve and why do we deserve that? Jesus, Jesus came to take care of what we deserve. So what is it that you and I deserve? Well, what you and I deserve is hell. That may may seem harsh, maybe, for you. But the fact is, is who here can number their transgressions? Who here could count high enough to recall every time you've done something that God wouldn't be pleased with? Uh, Let's get more specific. How many lies do you think you've ever told in your lifetime? How many times do you think you've ever thought a stupid thought because the Bible says a thought of foolishness is sin? Maybe right there you're saying, oh, preacher, you're, you're just making the standard too unattainable. Yeah, you're right. You're picking up on it. None of us. None of us. Good enough. How many times have you ever had lust in your heart? How many times covetousness, jealousy? How many times have you ever put anything before God 
in your life. That's idolatry. How many times have you ever disobeyed your parents? How many times have you ever taken things that don't belong to you? How many times have you ever, you ever done any of those kinds of things? And, and, and throughout all the years, I mean, there's not a number large enough for us. We've done those things. And, and listen, then you have to consider the dignity of the office. We, we scoff at this idea of eternal punishment. But, but if you sin against me, it's not a big deal that, that much. I mean, it's big. I'm going to be mad, and I may put some on Facebook about you later on. But it's not that bad because I'm not that big of a dude. If you sin against your parents, that may carry a little bit more consequence because they carry a bigger stick than I do in your realm of authority. If you sin against the President of the United States of America, which is called treason, then, then you're in big trouble because the dignity of the office. Well, here's the thing this morning. Your sin this morning isn't on a horizontal plane. You haven't just sinned against the preacher. You haven't just sinned against your parents. You haven't just sinned against the President of the United States of America. Although you probably have said some things about him. <laughs> no, no, no. Your sin is primarily vertical. You've sinned against the God that's given you life. You wouldn't have life if it wasn't for him. You wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for him. And, and yet here's, here's our idea about it. Right now, I can promise you, folks are thinking this. This has just taken way too long. I mean, do we have to spend this much time learning about the God that gave me life? <laughs> you don't have time to read His Word. You don't have time to come to church. You don't have time to pray. You're, it's, it's your money. You're not going to invest it in the work of God. I mean, it doesn't, nothing matters. We deserve hell because we're sinners. And we know that. We know that. Um, here's what John 3.16 is saying. Jesus is a qualified substitute for you. You broke the law. I broke the law. We deserve the punishment for breaking the law. We deserve to die and go to hell. But Jesus is not just a qualified substitute. He's the only qualified substitute. He's the only begotten Son of God. And so 2,000 years ago, Jesus took our place on the cross. The suffering, the agony that was intended for us forever because of our sin. Jesus paid for in six hours because He's perfect. You and I couldn't have done it in six hours. We couldn't have done it in six millennia because we're imperfect. And so we could never fully pay, which means we have to continuously pay without end. But Jesus is a qualified, the only qualified substitute. You know, one of the questions, whenever I'm just thinking about this, is why in the world would it please the Lord to bruise His own Son. It's Isaiah 53, verse number 10. Why would God be satisfied by having His own Son put to death in our place? It seems so radical, so, it's just so different from our own thought patterns. Why would God be pleased to send His only begotten Son to the cross to stretch his arms out, to suffer, to bleed, and to die the most horrific death. The, the word excruciating comes from the word crucifixion. Excruciating pain. Why in the world would God do that? You have your Bibles open there to John chapter 3. Here's why Jesus says God would do that. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Can, can I say this with logical precision? I, I don't think you could be more precise than what I'm about to be with you right now. God the Father would rather His Son suffer and die on the cross than for you and I to spend eternity in hell. Wow. 
And that's incredible, isn't it? You wonder why Paul could tell the church in Corinth, it's the goodness of God. Or Paul to the Romans, it's the goodness of God. It ought to lead us to repentance. Make that sacrifice for us. And so Jesus willingly and lovingly comes and goes to the cross and literally suffers our hell in our place. Just I'm, I'm going to read one more verse to you and we're going to pray this morning. Please, please don't rush out of here. Please don't, please don't tune me off. Don't, please don't, oh man, he's finally finished. Let me wrap this up and we're about to get out of here. Please don't miss this. The whole entire gospel message is contained in, in another verse that I want, to, I want to give to you this morning. It's not even the entire verse. But it, but it adequately portrays exactly the work that Jesus, the unique, only begotten Son of God, accomplished for us on the cross. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. Your sin and my sin separated us from God. And because we're separated from God, we deserve to die and go to hell. Peter says, but Christ came and He suffered on the cross. He suffered. Now it's interesting, you can't miss this, because if you miss this, you'll miss heaven. Okay, it's that serious. Christ has once, you read it in your Bible, Christ has once suffered. Not over and over and over and over and over again. But one time, 2,000 years ago, this is the day that the Lord has made. Christ once suffered for sins. The just Christ. The unjust, the world, us, you, me. That He, the suffering one, might bring us, the sinner, back over there to God. He reaches through our sin. You, you know, um, bring us to God. It's the doctrine of reconciliation. <laughs> it's a cool word. All it means is to be connected with. Sin broke the chain. Jesus fixes it where it can't never be broke again. But you and I have to trust Him as our Savior for what He's done on our behalf to count for us. Wouldn't it be tragedy of tragedies for God to love the world so much that He would give His only begotten Son in that sense and you still to turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to it, live your own life, maybe enjoy it for a time and still die and go to hell. Please, please, please don't do that. Please, please just grab a hold of who Jesus Christ is and what He can be for you if you just come to Him this morning. Let's stand for prayer.